So we're so glad to have everybody here and I'm exceptionally excited to have Dr. Arnold um, here as our discussant. I'm really interested in hearing his perspective on this topic, especially as a child psychiatrist where ADHD is our bread and butter. Um, Dr. Arnold is a board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist. He's professor emeritus of psychiatry at Ohio State University, where he was formerly director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and vice chair of psychiatry and was recently interim director of the Nissinger Center University of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. He has had over 50 years of experience in child psychiatric research, including our, the famous MTA or multimodal treatment study of children with ADHD, for which he was executive secretary and chair of the steering committee. For his work on the MTA, he received the NIH Director's Award. We could go on and on and on about all the accolades that he's had. He's worked in areas of autism, disabilities, ADHD. He's given us a lot of the research that we use it as um, integrative psychiatrists to be able to um, validate and justify the use of lots of different things that we do. Um, and I'm exceptionally grateful to have him here to teach us. Um, he uh, has publications include nine books, more than 70 chapters, more than 370 articles, and he has a particular interest and alternative and complementary treatments for ADHD and autism. He undertook an NIMH funded multi-site double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial of neurofeedback at the request of Chad, where he is currently resident expert and also um, worked on the MADI trial that just published on the use of micronutrients in emotional regulation of children with ADHD. So with that, I, I think we're all excited to hear what his views are of ADHD. And um, with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Arnold. Okay, I'm Gene Arnold and I approve that message. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so the screen is not an illusion, but uh, I think ADHD is in a way. Now uh, we have to, I guess before we get into it, we have to, oh boy, let's see. Um, is this gonna, there we go. Um, before we get into it, I need to disclose uh, uh, the possible conflicts of interest, but none of these are really very relevant to what I'll be talking about today, which is focused more on the reality and diagnosis of ADHD. <clears throat> so since we're uh, talking about, um, boy, this, huh. Do I have to click on it each It's time? good now. Okay. Maybe use the Since arrows on the keyboard. Talking about an illusion. Let, let's um, let's talk about let's uh, figure out the definitions. Uh, and uh, there was uh, recent research in science that explains why uh, the human brain is a self-organizing system, and we try to impose order on an unruly world. And the world, of course, is getting more unruly than ever now. So we're trying. Uh, Various people are trying desperately to impose some order on that. Uh, we, we're trying to structure our understanding, and that leads us into tricking ourselves into seeing and believing connections that don't really exist. We're always trying to connect the dots. Uh, and here's um, uh, this has been no known for a long time, going back as far as William James, the father of American psychiatry. Uh, who said, whilst what we perceive comes through our senses from the object before us, another part, and it may be the larger part, always comes out of our own mind. And of course, to my two favorite philosophers, Yogi Berra, who said, I wouldn't have seen it if I didn't believe it. And Jesus of Nazareth, who said, none so blind as those who will not see, none so deaf as those who will not hear. Seeing is believing but believing is also seeing. More recent scientific basis found that um, uh, what we uh, see is affected by what's going on in our heads. When we're hungry, we're, food words are brighter and clearer, for example. Something inside us selects the information that we see. And this happens at a basic perceptual level, not just at the processing in the brain. <clears throat> So um, diagnosis is a kind of a way 
It's a structure that we make up, a concept to try to make sense out of the world. Uh, but we tend to reify that, uh, to believe it's something real there. We even capitalize the names of a diagnosis. It affects our perspective, uh, things we expect. I remember Paul Wender remarking in the late 60s that when he first learned about this, which was even before the name ADHD was invented, when it was called minimal brain dysfunction or minimal brain damage or uh, hyperkinetic syndrome or something like that. He said that uh, when he first learned about this, he began to think he was paranoid because he saw it everywhere. It's our brainchild and we tend to be overprotective of it. We're helicopter parents. Uh, when a Thomas Saz or uh, Peter Bregan uh, claim there ain't no such thing, uh, we get defensive and circle the wagons, but we really should be our, our own critics. We should be the, the most uh, severe critics of our own concepts if we're going to be scientific. Well, why diagnose in the first place? I talked about some of the cons. Here are some of the pros. It's very convenient for, for example, prognosticating. We know that if someone meets the DSM-5 criteria for ADHD, there's a higher risk of later substance use, a high risk of school dropouts, a high risk of uh, multiple job quittings or firings, uh, a high risk of accidents, traffic accidents. Uh, and now we even know there's a higher risk of dying younger uh, as uh, Russell Barclay's uh, recent publication showed. Uh, we know that if we have a diagnosis according to DSM, uh, that uh, two thirds of those so diagnosed will respond well to the first stimulant we try. And two thirds of the rest will respond to a different stimulant, different molecule. Uh, it's convenient for doing research. One investigator will know exactly what sort of population the other is talking about. You can replicate results. And you can find causes. You can compare people who have the diagnosis to healthy controls and find, for example, that um, the uh, caudate nucleus and cerebellar vermis are 10% smaller in the ADHD group. Or you can compare e EEGs and find different connectivities uh, in the default mode network and the uh, and dorsal and ventral um, attention networks. Um, there's a philosophical satisfaction in being able to name the beast, tame it by naming it. Uh, and the patients and parents of our children, the child patients, expect a diagnosis. And the longer the name, the more impressive it is. Like the patient who was told by his physician, well, after doing all these tests, uh, I, I believe you have fulminating uh, oat cell uh, pulmonary adenocarcinoma. And the patient breathes a sigh of relief and says, thank God, I thought I had lung cancer. Mm. So we're trying to carve up nature with our, um, with our diagnoses. And uh, that's affected by a lot of things, including semantics. Uh, words. Uh, we, for example, <clears throat> the uh, internet connection uh, uh, here is unstable, it just told me. For example, um, how many colors are in the rainbow? Well, that's affected by whether you have a word for it. Um, for ex there's a uh, South Sea Island um, uh, culture where the, the language does not have uh, two words for blue and green, just one single word denoting both colors, they would only see six colors in the rainbow instead of seven. But it's not really limited to seven either. An artist might tell you that there's chartreuse between the yellow and the green, or a um, uh, uh, someone who's colorblind might uh, not see as many colors. Uh, or there may be a fuchsia between the orange and the red somewhere. Uh, so uh, we, we um, 
the number of colors in the rainbow is an arbitrary convention, uh, which any fourth grader, of course, can recite the seven colors. Now, notice the difference between the left and the right picture. This is the same rainbow. The one on the left, that the left end of the rainbow was in a cloudy condition, and this is a close-up of it, whereas the one on the right was more in a clear sky and from a, a greater distance. <clears throat> so what you, you may, when you first see these, you may think they're two different rainbows. Uh, they even slant a different direction, but it's the same rainbow, just a different part of it. So how close we are to the thing we're perceiving and what other things are around it, what, what the cloud cover is, will affect what we see, uh, what we perceive. Oh, heck. Okay, so uh, how do we approach this business of carving up nature? Well, there's a statistical strategy. Uh, you can have uh, like two standard deviations above the norms on a rating scale of symptoms. <clears throat> you can have a neuropsychological uh, strategy where you have uh, certain uh, deficits in, uh, in mental processing on neuropsychological tests. You can have a neurophysiological strategy where you have different EEGs, uh, even different uh, peripheral measures like um, uh, skin conductance or uh, uh, EMGs. A uh, biochemical strategy with uh, deficit of dopamine, a neuroanatomical strategy with uh, smaller areas in the nucleus accumbens or uh, caudate nucleus. Uh, you have family history, uh, genetic strategy, uh, and the Cantwell criteria, which take all of these into consideration. However, our diagnostic uh, approach is very superficial. The DSM-5 is officially phenomenological. Um, it's, um, uh, and, um, it's, it just has operant uh, uh, criteria uh, that don't say anything about the underlying psychology uh, or the uh, neuropsychological or neurophysiological or biochemical or neuroanatomical genetic layers of this. Uh, we, we like to get uh, farther down deeper in our understanding of the disorder. Now the diagnostic criteria are pretty widely known. Um, and I won't repeat them here. Uh, this is a good representation of the hyperactive impulsive presentation. And um, here's uh, a good example of the inattentive presentation uh, shown by Agnes, uh, who says, the next step on my quest to avoid being a complete failure is organizational skills. And her friend Trout asked, what will that involve? And Agnes says, I'm not sure I had a brochure on it, but I can't find it anywhere. And Trout, who obviously subscribes to the um, bartender school of psychotherapy, says, you should be more organized. Agnes thought that was a good idea and says, I'll write it that on my chart when I find my Sharpies, thus illustrating the feckless plight of inattentive ADHD. Uh, the most neglected and most important criterion for ADHD is the fifth one, which is that it's not better explained by another disorder. ADHD is a criterion of exclusion. Uh, I like to characterize it as naked, uh, uh, naked uh, executive function control, uh, uh, discontrol, <laughs> excuse me, executive function, uh, executive uh, function dis dysfunction. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll have to come back to that one. <laughs> Maybe I have a touch of ADHD myself. Okay. Um, and the, the, um, 
uh, in, in other words, not uh, not uh, having the trappings of mood disorder, anxiety, uh, or um, other uh, psychiatric disorders or physical disorders. Among the things that can both aggravate ADHD symptoms and mimic ADHD are, of course, the lifestyle issues of sleep deprivation, lack of exercise, uh, uh, nutritional deficiencies, um, and of course, uh, the other side of that is uh, toxins that may be in the environment, uh, endocrine dysfunction, uh, somewhat less than 5% of people who meet ADHD criteria otherwise for ADHD turn out to have uh, thyroid dysfunction or possibly diabetes. Um, so um, let's take a look at some uh, illusions. Uh, if you focus on the middle of one of these uh, circles here, you'll see that the snakes are moving, which they're really not, of course. But at first glance, we might call these hyperkinetic snakes. Now, here is a picture of a slanted wavy line disorder, except you all know that these lines are not wavy or slanted. They're perfectly straight and parallel, and you can prove it by laying a ruler on them. What it really is, is an illusion created by the uh, black squares that are in stacks staggered here. So it's really a black square stack staggered disorder. Uh, and um, if we take a close, another look at it, we notice the white squares. Uh, so maybe it's actually a, a stack staggered white square disorder. Or maybe it's combined presentation, black and white stack staggered square disorder. But if we take an even closer look and uh, imagine that the light is coming in from the right, we can see here on the, the face of this cube here uh, that here is um, the uh, right uh, facing uh, uh, surface of the cube and the black square here is the left facing uh, part of that cube, and you have these cubes stacked up. So maybe it's actually um, stacked staggered cube disorder. Uh, and if you imagine the light coming in from the left, you can see that it actually has two presentations, one with the <clears throat> one with the the cubes starting here and another with the cubes starting uh, here, down here. OK, now on this one, I think you already all know that these lines, these two horizontal lines are the same length. But they appear a different length because of what's surrounding them. <clears throat> there was an interesting experiment done by uh, Abakoff and Klein back in the 90s uh, in which they had child uh, models uh, make videos in which uh, they varied the amount of hyperactivity and aggression. And they found that teachers tended to rate the same amount of hyperactivity uh, more, as more severe when it was accompanied by aggression. So the aggression colored the perception of the uh, hyperactivity. Now, the object here is to count the, the black dots. <clears throat> How many are, uh, black dots are there? And of course, um, what this illustrates is <clears throat> that what you at first see may be exactly the opposite of what's actually there. Because when you're seeing the black dots, you're seeing them in the middle of a white circle. So what's actually there is white. What you see is black. So it's the difference between black and white, between your perception and the reality. Now we talked about some optical and visual uh, illusions, but there are several other senses. And um, one of these is the auditory, which is very important 
in ADHD because sound is sequential. And if you miss part of it, you've missed it. Whereas something visual, you can go back and reread, uh, go back and check it again and fill in what you missed. <clears throat> it's interesting that the normal toddler hyperactivity ends with the development of fluent language. I have a very per personal anecdote about that. Our um, uh, fourth child, Mark, uh, was not talking by the age of two, and he was extremely hyperactive. Uh, once I had an extension ladder up where I was working on the roof, I went in to get a drink of water and came out and found him up on the top of the extension ladder at 18 months old. We joked that we should get him an extension ladder for his second birthday. Um, he would get into everything, always running. And um, we, uh, because he wasn't talking yet and his younger brother, a uh, year younger was already talking uh, we were a bit concerned that he might be mentally retarded, which was the common term at that time. It's not politically correct now, but that, that was perfectly acceptable back at many decades ago. Uh, so we took him to my mentor, Alejandro Rodriguez. I was a resident at the time. And uh, we, uh, after about five minutes, uh, Mark started climbing Alejandro's bookshelves. Uh, not surprisingly, that's pretty much what he did most of the time, climbing and running. And um, Alejandro peeled him off the second to top shelf and uh, noticed that he was trying to get to a toy airplane up there. So he held the plane up and he said to Mark, uh, uh, say plane and I'll give it to you. Uh, well, Mar Mark tried to grab it instead of saying the word. And uh, Alejandro said, no, I'll smack your hand. Now, imagine this. You take your kid to a child psychiatrist, and within 10 minutes, he's threatening to smack him. You know you have problems. <laughs> but to our, and Billy and I looked at each other, and we, we laughed because we knew he wasn't going to get Mark to talk. Uh, and um, to our surprise, Mark did say plain. He didn't want to get smacked. <laughs> so uh, he, Alejandro gave him the plane. He said, OK, take him home. Don't give him anything he wants unless he says the word for two weeks. And um, then uh, come back and we'll see if there's still a problem. We'll, we'll then maybe try some amphetamine or something. But um, uh, you know, try, try this. So we took him home. And within a week, he was talking fluently. And interestingly, his hyperactivity completely subsided. And he turned into one of the most laid back kids you'd ever imagine. And by the way, he's fluent in both English and French. And he edited a magazine. Uh, and he gives a nice lecture. <clears throat> so that's my anecdote about the importance of language and the auditory sphere. Now, another way of, uh, of slicing up ADHD is um, um, inattentive versus uh, a combined presentation. And this can have some effect on treatment outcome. Uh, this was a, a study of 112 uh, kids with both, some of them combined, some inattentive type who were in a trial of L-carnitine for ADHD. And the um, outcome was teacher rated inattention. The dotted lines represent uh, the inattentive type. The solid lines represent the combined type of ADHD. And the open, the X's uh, and the, um, I'm sorry, uh, the X's and the open squares uh, represent the placebo and the, uh, uh, Solid circle represents active uh, combined treatment, and the um, diamond-shaped black represents the active inattentive, the active treatment. Uh, you can see 
that both placebo lines and the um, combined active treatment are pretty much congruent, but the um, inattentive type uh, who got the uh, active treatment uh, separated, and that is a significant separation. <clears throat> Another way of uh, slicing and dicing is uh, the ICD-10 hyperkinetic disorder. Um, this was uh, uh, changed in uh, ICD-11. They moved over more to the ADHD definition. But essentially, uh, if they had comorbid anxiety or depression, uh, you couldn't diagnose hyperkinetic disorder. You diagnose the anxiety or depression. and <clears throat> So uh, also the, the requirement for severity was a little bit more. So this essentially, uh, the hyperkinetic disorder was essentially a very severe combined type ADHD without comorbidity. Uh, that is without internalizing comorbidity. They could have ODD or CD with it. Uh, and only a fourth of the MTA sample met uh, the criteria for hyperkinetic disorder uh, when they were re-diagnosed. And uh, there were some interesting results, uh, effects there. Uh, you'll notice, uh, first of all, that uh, the hyperkinetic disorder, the graph on the right, starts at a more severe level at baseline than the rest of the sample. Now, on the left, the, sam the part of the sample that did not have hyperkinetic disorder pretty much reflected the whole sample uh, finding. Uh, the, the blue line represents the community comparison group who got usual tra treatment as usual, uh, not, no treatment from the study. The yellow line got a multi-component psychosocial treatment, including 35 parent training sessions, 10 teacher consultations, eight weeks of a full-time summer therapeutic camp, and 12 weeks of a half-time paraprofessional aid in the classroom that fall. Um, the um, Magenta line is the medication management systematically uh, without the psychosocial treatment. And the dark line is a co combination of both medication management and psychosocial treatment. You can see the medication management with or without the psychosocial treatment is uh, the two bottom lines are significantly better than either the, the uh, psychosocial treatment, the behavioral treatment, or the community comparison group. However, on the right, you can see that hyperkinetic disorder has a much more significant uh, medication effect uh, and uh, with more separation from the behavioral treatment group and the community comparison. And in fact, the community comparison group, two thirds of whom got a little bit of medication from their community providers, uh, moved uh, ahead of the behavioral treatment, but not significantly so. Uh, the difference between the top two lines and the bottom two is, is very significant on, on the right-hand graph. Okay, but what happened to these when they grew up? Well, as adults, only 5% still met the hyperkinetic disorder criteria, less than the, num the percent of the other group who originally did not meet high hyperkinetic disorder criteria. Uh, more of them uh, did meet it now as adults, but very few of either group did. Uh, of the, those who uh, had hyperkinetic disorder as adults, uh, only 31% met the symptom count and impairment criteria for ADHD versus 36% of the others. And similarly, for the categorically diagnosed, the uh, symptomatic severity and so forth. In other words, you couldn't tell the difference once they grew up. However, those with comorbid anxiety who were excluded from the hyperkinetic disorder group uh, then did have more persistent adult severity and um, ADHD persistence. So even though this, this subgroup, hyperkinetic disorder, were more severe at baseline, uh, they uh, did not, were not as severe as adults as those who were excluded from that group. 
who had comorbid anxiety. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, only 31% of these uh, uh, combined type ADHD kids uh, did not have a comorbidity. Most common, of course, were disruptive mood disorder with 54%, I'm sorry, disruptive behavior disorder with 54% um, and anxiety with a third. And that anxiety percentage did not include those with specific phobia. It was only other anxiety disorders. So what did effect did anxiety have? Well, those without baseline anxiety are shown here, and it reflects what I showed you on the left graph before, which is that the blue medication management and the red combination treatment are significantly better than the green behavioral treatment or the black community comparison group. However, those who have anxiety now have a significant superiority of behavioral treatment over the community comparison group. And um, it uh, moves closer to medication management, but is still uh, different, uh, significantly different from medication management. And you can see that we have this kind of extra boost in here um, of, of the uh, combination adding behavioral treatment to medication management seems to um, add an extra bit of benefit, although this difference was not significant. Another way of looking at the effect of comorbidity on outcome <clears throat> is to see that um, uh, here we have effect sizes and higher is better. On the other graphs, lower was better, but higher is better here. And these are effect sizes compared to the community comparison group here. Um, so uh, community comparison is zero effect by definition. And then the black line represents the 31% pure ADHD with no comorbidity. Uh, and you can see here that medication management either alone or with uh, psychosocial treatment uh, is better than behavioral treatment alone or community comparison. Pretty much what I showed you on the left side of the previous graphs. <clears throat> if we take the, the yellow line uh, with anxiety, without disruptive behavior disorder, without ODD or CD, uh, we see that any treatment works. Uh, behavioral treatment alone, medication alone or the combination, and you don't get any extra benefit from combining them. So you can save money and just give one or the other treatment for those with comorbid anxiety. Uh, those who had uh, disruptive behavior disorder, the green line without anxiety need medication. And it doesn't matter whether they get behavioral treatment with it, it's, it's, they, they need the medication. Okay, and those who uh, had uh, both comorbidities, both anxiety and disruptive behavior disorder, get some benefit for many treatment, but they get the real boost, the additive effect here of the combination treatment uh, on the right uh, compared to medication alone or behavioral treatment alone, which were pretty much the same. Okay, uh, this, so anxiety is an interesting uh, surrounding cloud uh, with uh, ADHD. Although it responds well, uh, this combination responds well to any treatment in childhood, the comorbid anxiety predicts a greater persistence of ADHD symptoms into adulthood. In fact, the childhood predictors of adult ADHD persistence include as expected, severity of initial ADHD symptoms, anxiety, depression, or other comorbidities, parental mental health problems. Apparently, the parents with mental health problems are not able to provide as much support uh, to the child in their development. Uh, and um, surprisingly, IQ, socioeconomic status, and the um, did not make a difference. And parent-child relationship didn't make a difference. <clears throat> Now, this is a rather complex graph, so I'll, I'll walk you through it carefully. 
uh, first of all, to divide it up, uh, the, the four bars on the left here are the local normative comparison group. Uh, these, uh, this set of bars is the whole ADHD part of the sample. And these four represent the subgroups by original treatment assignment. You can see these five uh, groupings do not differ much. They're pretty much the same. Over here, we have them divided by whether they were consistently medicated here or inconsistently here or negligibly medicated here. Uh, negligibly or not at all. And uh, the blue bars represent self-rating of ADHD symptoms at the 16-year follow-up. The um, red bar represents the parent rating, the green bar is the average of the two, and this, these purple bars represent the difference between parent rating and self-rating. And uh, the lower they go, the more the uh, self-rating uh, exceeded the parent rating. I'm sorry, I was better than the parent rating, less, less severe. Uh, the parent rating was more severe by that amount. Okay, so uh, we can see pretty much here, there's a consistent self-rating better than parent rating. And um, the, um, it didn't matter which treatment they originally got or how much medication they, they took uh, over time. But what you notice here is that the local normative comparison group actually did not, those uh, kids grown up did not rate themselves better than the parents rated them. Uh, the, the, uh, in fact, it was a little bit the other direction. They rated themselves as having more severe symptoms. Of course, in general, they didn't have as many symptoms because they were sele not selected for having ADHD to begin with. So <clears throat> um, this, these sections here represent the positive illusory bias that youngsters with ADHD have, where they perceive themselves as more competent than they really are. And apparently that positive illusory bias persists at least to age 25. Uh, persistence rates uh, are higher, therefore, when using parent ratings rather than self-reports, and structured interviews rather than rating scales, and the norm-based threshold of four symptoms rather than five in adulthood. <clears throat> uh, Maggie Sibley did some uh, important work teasing out that if you uh, check against impairment, that four symptoms is actually a better delineator of adult ADHD than five symptoms. And using that norm-based item level, either or rule, that is if either parent or self reported it at, a, at, a, at that particular item, it was counted. There was 60% persistence to adulthood by symptom count, 41% by symptom count plus impairment. Uh, since you have to have impairment for a disorder, only 41% actually had the disorder in adulthood. But uh, there were other problems that were not reflected in this particular measure. There were three patterns of adult functional outcomes, making a difference whether you lose your ADHD symptoms along the way. Uh, the first pattern is that losing the ADHD symptoms helps some but does not get you back to a normal level. Uh, in other words, symptom persistent ADHD was the worst. The LNCG, the local normative comparison group was best. With those who lost their symptoms, symptom desistant ADHD in between. And this included uh, the completion of college, uh, times fired or quit a job, current income, whether they were receiving public assistance and risky sexual behavior. The second pattern was that once you lost the symptoms, uh, you were pretty much back on a normal path. Uh, and this was with emotional outcomes and subs substance abuse risk. Um, that this, those who had symptom, those who were symptom desistant uh, had the same level as the local normative comparison group 
with the symptom persistent ADHD significantly worse. Uh, there were also some things that it didn't, there weren't, wasn't enough power in the analysis to detect a difference of any kind. Remar one of those was that there were 10 deaths in the ADHD group. Remember I mentioned according to uh, Barclay's paper, there's a high risk you lose about 10 years of life with untreated ADHD. Um, and uh, now we, we would expect a five to one ratio because there were twice as many LNCG followed up. Uh, I'm sorry, twice as many ADHD followed up as LNCG. The LNCG was only half as large a sample. So it should have been five to one, but it was 10 to one ratio. Okay, then um, <clears throat> here's an example of um, the first pattern where losing the symptoms helps, but doesn't completely eliminate the problem. Um, uh, the gray bar here represents the LNCG percent who finished college, uh, who, who had this post-secondary education. Uh, Black is the whole ADHD sample. On the right, we split between the ADHD to sisters who were significantly better than the ADHD per sisters. <clears throat> uh, this is an example of the second pattern where losing the ADHD symptoms gets you to a level the same as the LNCG. These two top ones our emotional lability, this is anxiety, this is depression, they all pretty much show the same thing, a significant difference between the LNCG, uh, the gray bar, and the ADHD, the dark bar, uh, but then a difference between the ADHD persisters and desisters with the desisters um, being about the same as the LNCG. Now, there's been a documented historical increase in the diagnosis of ADHD. <clears throat> this is partly illusion, of course, diagnostic liberalism. Um, I can remember when uh, pediatricians would see a kid in their office and say, I don't find this child hyperkinetic in a 15 minute observation. Uh, we all know that in a novel situation, the child's symptoms may abate. Um, the, um, I hope I can finish before the computer restarts. Um, uh, the, uh, but now uh, everybody's been primed to diagnose it, maybe overdiagnose it at times. Uh, there's increased alertness and knowledge about it. Teachers know what it is, parents know what it is, and they bring, bring the child for diagnosis. Adults uh, perceive it in themselves and come in to be diagnosed. Um, there's been an unmasking by epidemiology uh, where uh, epidemiologic studies found a higher rate of ADHD than uh, the diagnostic uh, uh, rates in clinics. Uh, unmasking by a changing environment. Um, uh, if, if I were designing uh, a school program for a child with ADHD, I would want small classes I'd want a mix of age groups because the older kids have a settling influence on, on kids with ADHD and the opportunity for the child with ADHD to tutor a younger child gives them self-confidence and self-esteem that they do know something, they can do something useful. <clears throat> uh, chores to break up uh, the day, uh, like cleaning the blackboard, uh, carrying out the ashes, bringing in firewood, a close tie between the school and the parents, the community. So what am I describing? A one-room school. A hundred years ago, most Americans were educated in a one-room school where ADHD symptoms were unwittingly being treated uh, by a therapeutic environment. <clears throat> uh, my, uh, my father, uh, attended a one-room school. My mother taught in one, not the same school or the same time in case, in case you were wondering, but uh, uh, it's, it's uh, a bit, been a huge change in the educational environment. <clears throat> the increase, of course, is not all illusion. It's partly real. There's a, a better obstetrical salvage 
of uh, preterm infants uh, and those with complications who have a high risk of developing ADHD uh, through true brain tra trauma. Um, and um, uh, the social educational changes that I described, uh, urbanization, industrialization, the information society uh, brings out the, uh, the problems of ADHD, uh, which brings us to uh, the definition of impairment. Uh, all the diagnostic criteria are quantitative. Uh, we all have a little bit of distraction. We all have a, a little bit of uh, impulsiveness. Uh, it's normal. It's like hypertension. We all have blood pressure, but some people have too much of a good thing and it becomes problematic for them. So it depends on impairment. But how much impairment do you need? Uh, impairment in the information age may not be the same as impairment in the industrial age or agricultural age or hunter-gatherer age. Another thing is, is underachievement and impairment. If somebody with an IQ of 135 is getting a C plus average, um, are they impaired? I mean, they're performing as well as average, but but they're not up to their potential. So is that an impairment? And can you sum up many small impairments to a diagnostic level? If they're just a little bit impaired socially, a little bit academically, a little bit here, a little bit there, uh, do you add that up and say, okay, they, they deserve a diagnosis? And finally, is below average an impairment? <clears throat> uh, we, uh, we don't live in Lake Wobegon where all the children are above average. We live in the real world where it's necessary mathematically for 49% of the population to be below average. So those of us who consider ourselves above average owe a real debt to those who perform the necessary mathematical uh, duty of being below average. It's a dirty job, but somebody has to do it and we should be grateful to them. So there's been a hubbub about late onset ADHD. There was an article claiming a lot of people were, uh, had ADHD onset in adulthood. We've, we took a look at the MTA Local Normative Comparison Group to see how factual that might be. Uh, two and a half percent of them had adolescent onset ADHD syndrome. And those usually had a subthreshold symptom count as a child. <clears throat> in other words, they were just below below the surface, below the threshold, maybe three or four symptoms. Uh, and then something happened that, that increased that. <clears throat> Only less than a half a percent had real adult onset ADHD. Um, and it, in those cases, it was usually complicated by other disorders. There was no evidence for adult onset ADHD independent of a complex psychiatric history. Um, and let's take a look at some of the examples. Here is an adolescent limited ADHD case. The bl dark black line here represents inattentive symptoms. The dark red line represents uh, hyperactive impulsive symptoms. The dotted and dashed lines represent separate ratings by parents, teachers, and self ratings. So we can see here that around the age of 13, uh, this person, uh, went up into the diagnostic threshold represented by the purple area up here at the top. In other words, six symptoms as a child up to the age of 17, uh, five symptoms by DSM-5 for an adult here. Then here's an example of an adolescent onset persistent ADHD um, where they didn't, they didn't meet criteria as children but about age 15, uh, they, uh, where well, they were stressed by high school. And notice the IQ, 121. The characteristic of these adolescent onset is high IQ, uh, which allows them to skim by in um, elementary and middle school, maybe getting a C plus average instead of A plus. And uh, then high school, the stress of self-organizing in high school brings out the problem and the stress of the self-organizing on the job and 
paying their bills on time, keeping a schedule, et cetera, brings out as an adult. Here is um, the uh, only adult on, pure adult onset case that we can find in the local normative comparison group. <clears throat> and you notice the problems here as an adult, uh, ODD, sleep problems, subfacial mood problems, and so forth, aggravating the uh, symptoms and just barely gone into the, into the symptomatic area here. Uh, you may have seen the, the uh, cover of the journal, <coughs> American Journal of Psychiatry uh, for Feb this February, this past February, which had this on the cover. Uh, another graph by Maggie Sibley, uh, <coughs> who was also author of the graphs I just showed you from a previous publication. And here, look at this roller coaster of symptoms, the fluctuating course. And the, there, was, there were several who had this kind of a course of symptoms where if you, uh, if you die, uh, evaluated them here, you'd say they have ADHD. If you evaluated them here, you'd say they remitted. If you evaluated them here, you'd say they have ADHD. If you evaluate here, you'd say they remitted. If you evaluate here, they have it. So you can't, because somebody loses their symptoms and seems to be functioning normally at one point, you can't say, okay, they're cured, they're recovered. You have to follow them, maybe periodic annual visits to see what's happening over time. <clears throat> now, uh, there's um, uh, an issue that we need to really uh, pay attention to having to do with uh, uh, evolution uh, of uh, both genes and environment. The environment evolves faster than the genes and the genes try to keep up. Um, so genes that would have been very adaptive when you had to be distractible enough to notice a saber toothed tiger creeping up on you or a wolf creeping up on your flock of sheep uh, might not be so adaptive uh, when you have to sit at a desk in a classroom all day and soak up facts or uh, sit at a desk in front of a computer uh, and uh, do your work. So um, we, we often hear that uh, ADHD is 70 to 80% heritable. And there's a, a pitfall in that. Uh, that has a danger, the risk of falling into the trap of uh, genetic determinism. <clears throat> there's not much we can do about it. It's just in the genes. That's it. But uh, that, that's based on the fallacy that heritability and environment add up to 100%. They actually add up to more than that. <clears throat> Take the example of PKU. It's 100% genetic, a well-established inborn error of metabolism. It's also 100% environmental because it's only a problem in an environment that has phenylalanine in the diet. That's why we do the diaper test. So the formula is there at the bottom for um, how much the environmental risk is. And for ADHD, it's between 20% and 100%. All the genetic things could be uh, vulnerability to things in the environment. And they could be things in the environment that didn't exist 100 years ago. All the insecticides, all the industrial chemicals that we now have, the, the new uh, construction materials, the new uh, plastics, uh, the, the uh, water um, containers that we have made out of plastic. Uh, there are articles uh, blooming in the literature and from good sources like the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, linking up these chemicals, uh, a higher load of these chemicals uh, being associated with ADHD. Uh, another example is food dyes. Uh, the annual consumption of food dyes uh, from official records uh, cleared by the FDA is, <clears throat> has uh, quintupled in 50 years. And uh, the early 
uh, studies that failed to show an effect of food dyes on behavior used too low a dose to reflect current consumption. Swanson pointed this out many years ago. Jim Swanson had an article in which he showed there was a dose effect from uh, the food dyes. On the left, we have a map showing ADHD prevalence by state. And notice the Southwest has a very low prevalence, about half of the prevalence of the darkest states on the, on the east. Um, and on the right, <clears throat> we have a map of solar intensity with red being the most intense solar radiation. <clears throat> uh, it also so happens that those uh, Western states, Southwestern states have a higher altitude than most of the country, especially the East. <clears throat> um, if you um, go very uh, altitude, and both altitude and solar intensity uh, correlate with the prevalence of ADHD reported in those states. Um, if you co-vary altitude, the effect of solar intensity persists. If you co-vary solar intensity, the effect of altitude disappears, becomes non-significant. So it's probably solar intensity. And that was replicated in the study of eight different countries around the Mediterranean and in Europe. <clears throat> So is it a simple case of more vitamin D preventing ADHD? I don't think so. Uh, there's a lot more to it than this. Maybe people spend more time outside, uh, maybe in more in, in green spaces, outdoor green spaces. Uh, maybe they get more fresh air. Maybe, uh, maybe they're not exposed as much to uh, chemicals associated with uh, construction in, inside houses and inside cars. Maybe <clears throat> the flora and fauna are different by humidity, which is different with solar, uh, solar intensity. Notice that Florida, which uh, also has a fairly high solar intensity, but is very humid, uh, is not as red as the, um, the Southwestern states. <clears throat> So what happens is it a difference in the flora of the gut microbiome? Is it a difference in the parasites and infections carried by insects? Uh, a difference between the, um, uh, uh, the Ohio Valley lung uh, of histoplasmosis versus the San Joaquin Valley fever of um, of uh, coccidiomycosis? Uh, is there a difference between Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, a rickettsial tick disease, uh, versus uh, the Eastern uh, Lyme disease carried by deer ticks? Um, so there's all kinds of stuff here that needs to be explored uh, as possibly relating to uh, the genetic issues. Uh, to summarize, our perception of ADHD is influenced by surroundings, and we detect different aspects of it, uh, different parts of the elephant, uh, according to what subgroup we're looking at, different ways of classifying the words we have to describe it, the semantics, and the manifestations come and go over age, over the lifespan, by informant, by the time, by history, by geography, by environment. There are many mimics and aggravators and finally, we have to conclude that we really are paranoid projecting what we believe onto what we see and hear. <clears throat>